I thought I would start today. I'm talking about um, how I've been set free, and so many photographers have been set free by technology. And it was technology that um, I was terrified of when it first came out. Um, and I remember being in a meeting at National Geographic, Franz was probably there too, when Joe McNally came in and told us all that we should really look into digital photography. And every photographer in the room was like this, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, because, you know, we'd, we'd spent our career shooting film. And, but I have to tell you that there isn't a day that goes by that I'm not grateful for the technology and the freedom it's given us. So I'm going to start uh, with the very first time I left the country. I grew up in Minnesota. My folks didn't have means to travel. And so the very first place I went was the country of Namibia. And we were looking, this was a long time ago, uh, we were looking for a remote tribe that lived up the Skeleton Coast and inland. These people had lived through seven years of drought. And um, I can't quite imagine that. I mean, this is the desert they lived in, but can you imagine finding lunch? But they did. And the first people we saw were three women and some kids down in a little dry riverbed. And I went walking toward them, and they really looked at me as though I had arrived by spaceship or something. They, they just didn't get me at all. And um, back then, the only instant pictures you could show people were Polaroids. So I came up, and I took a Polaroid picture of them. They had no idea what I was doing. And then I handed them the little Polaroid. They didn't know what it was. But as their image came up on the Polaroid, these women fell on the ground and started laughing and pointing at each other. And without a single shared syllable of language, I knew they were going, oh, that's you. No, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's you. And it's because none of them had ever seen her own face before. Now, here I am. I'm a 25-year-old kid, never been out of the country. And I land in this place where, where truly amazing things were happening to me. And I didn't know it at the time, but it would lead me on the most important paths of my life. So here I am. And you can imagine that they weren't intimidated by me. I look like a bug, you know, with these glasses and this hat and my Minnesota Zoo t-shirt. Um, but what I love about this picture is it looks like we're chatting. And it felt that way. And I learned from that encounter that if you are willing to make an idiot out of yourself by pantomiming and engaging and looking people in the eyes, that will free them up to do the same. So without any language, um, you know, they were living in this stunning, stunning area. But they had to feed their babies. And they'd been through seven years of drought. And so one of the first things they did is they'd hold up a breast and point to their mouths. And I knew they were asking if, you know, they thought I was some kind of a witch, um, and maybe I was a good witch. And they were asking if I had anything they could take to help their milk come in. The thing I learned that was most important is that these women were not to be pitied. They were the opposite of helpless. They were survivors. They were smart. They were funny. They were elegant and proud, and they were keeping their kids alive against all odds. They lived with wildlife, you know, they all lived together, and you saw this incredible respect between the human animal and the, and the other animals, and the understanding that they, you know, could be each other's food. And so I, I, I just, I learned so much on this trip and, and the two things that came together for me here and that would follow me throughout my whole career is my love of the environment and my love of women in the developing world. Well, I was in Africa uh, two weeks ago, so I thought I better bring some new pictures. Um, and if you don't have enough fear in your life, show your wildlife pictures in front of Franz Lanting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, I always like to have some new work to show. And, you know, 
uh, every time I go to Africa, something that first trip comes back to me, and I'm I'm in the presence of such extraordinary life, and you know to to know that some of my colleagues are giving everything to protect these glorious animals. Um, I'm, I'm just so proud to be among them. And, you know, they're getting some really important work done to save endangered species and to, and to save environments and areas that the animals need to survive. So the other thing that you may notice in these pictures is the extraordinary sharpness. These, the lenses we have now, and you know, I, I'm lucky enough to be a Lumix Global Ambassador, and the Leica lenses that are part of that camera system are unbelievably sharp. And that just thrills me. And it's, it's so easy too, I mean, one of the things that I always talked with my kids about was special powers. Oh, I should introduce you to my kids. So there's my daughter, Lily. And she was the first one to arrive. And then her brother, Charlie. They're big now. But when they were little, they used to talk about superpowers. What superpower would I, you know, would we like? And they talked about flying. And, and I just always said, I want the invisibility cloak. I, I wish I could just go about and be in these communities and be in these places and, and have no one see me. And I, you know, I, I just wanted to look like somebody's mom, not like a photographer. And so this is the closest I ever got to an invisibility cloak. And it's, it's this wonderful gear that has allowed me to travel all over the world and rarely check a bag. Now, when I was traveling with my kids, flight attendants would see me coming and like run, because as a photographer and a mom with a baby, you know, with baby, I had us usually had about nine cases of equipment. Um, I did, in fact, pack my lenses in Pampers, and you know, it was just a different time. So to be free from that, and to be able to to travel, I can go for two weeks easy, with just carry on. And again, you know, what you get to do when you get there is mind-blowing. If, if any of you have not been to Antarctica and you're thinking about it, do it. And go to South Georgia. These are whales. The other thing about, and I'll talk about this throughout here, is, is that, you know, technology has freed us up to be playful. I was one of those people who got opportunity very, very young. So I never played. All of a sudden, it was really serious. And I've never played more than since I, you know, since digital came and I recognized that creativity needs a chunk of play in it. So these are penguins uh, on South Georgia. And they're just so graphic and fun, you know. Um, and you see things you really can't believe. But when you become a more creative photographer, you'll take, you know, these different kinds of pictures to tell the full story. And I've always been fascinated by feathers. It's, it, you know, it's just unbelievable, the detail. And to be able to capture that and bring it back is so rewarding. We saw this leopard seal, and she was really showing off. She was on a, an ice floe, and she was, you know, kind of, kind of enticing us. She was really a flirt, um, and so we got closer and closer. And then she slipped off the ice and proceeded to bite holes in five of the rafts that were out there. <laughs> and she, you know, <laughs> it's humbling. But I also love to show pieces of an animal in a way that it hasn't been seen. And, and, you know, to me, like this is an elephant seal, which they're just the goofiest looking things on earth. And yet, if you can just take a look at part of them, you see this 
like, you see why they can swim so deep. You see, you know, you see the aerodynamics. You see the beauty of their skin. So early on, I started doing work, um, you know, conservation work, uh, and I. I just loved it. I, I really like landscape photography. But also, there had to be a way to tell stories by having someone look at a picture and go, what the heck is that? And then you trick them into reading, and they find out. So this is salt piles that are left behind in the Dead Sea because it's shrinking so rapidly due to time, climate change. And this is all that's left of the mighty Colorado River by the time it reaches the Sea of Cortez, because we've siphoned off every drop. Imagine what that impact is on the Sea of Cortez and all of the life that depends upon it. These are pelicans in, a, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, and you can tell that this is a, a, an unnatural cut in the water. And it's, it's there because of the oil industry and they have just destroyed the salt marshes. And the salt marshes, in addition to being full of life, are also the protectors of the shore. And if you chop them up, or if you chop up dunes, then this extraordinary weather that we're experiencing comes roaring on shore and does a tremendous amount of additional damage inland. My girlfriend, Barbara King Solver, and I decided we wanted to do a project that would remind people of how, how little pristine wilderness is left in our country. So uh, Barbara wrote these incredible essays. And I decided to, tr to go back to an old technique um, that you guys may have seen with your parents' pictures and stuff where you hand color a black and white picture. So I shot it in black and white infrared. And then I hand colored the images. And um, it was just such a joyful endeavor. But more importantly, this project raised about a quarter of a million dollars for grassroots land conservation in our country. And boy, what, I got bit. It was like, so I can have my pictures be useful as well as beautiful? Like, just bring it on. That's what I want to be doing. And I did work for Habitat for Humanity, um, kind of on the, the topic of the dignity of helping to build your own home. And I'd go for a week every year, and I had to do, get 14 calendar pictures in a week all over the country, and sometimes the world, this is in Brazil. And it became like my favorite week of the year because once again, I'm with these wonderful people who are so underrepresented and are, are seeing their future for the first time for many of them. This guy was great. He was a habitat worker and uh, somebody had stolen the family car. It was a single mom with these darling kids. And, he, he just got mad, and he went out, and he found that car, and <laughs> he brought it back. And this is, he pulled into the driveway, and all the kids climbed into the car with him. But where my heart really was, was with women. And I've been privileged to work in almost 150 countries, and you cannot believe how many women have taken me in. And they've never heard of National Geographic. I'm this strange creature who arrives in their world, usually working with aid organizations, and they welcome me. I know a lot of us are afraid to photograph people, right? Show of hands, how many of you are afraid to photograph people? Oh, come on. <laughs> well, let me ask you something. How many people in this room have ever been on TV or in a newspaper, or in a magazine of some kind. Show of hands, how many, did you hate it? Or did you get five copies for your mom? You know, and that's what we have to understand when we are gonna photograph people. A lot of times we put it on them, right? We go, oh, I don't want to intrude. Oh, I don't want to interfere. What if they get mad? What, you know, and, and we make excuses putting the blame on them when really what's going on is we're feeling shy. 
we're feeling fear. And if you can get past that fear and understand that if they don't want their picture taken, they'll go like this, they'll go like this, they'll go like this, they'll go, you know, there's all, it's very clear ways they can tell you, and that's fine. And then you don't take their picture. But if you jump in, it's, you will not only travel, you will make friends and you will learn. So I started working for eight organizations. The last picture was India, this is in Rwanda. And um, I, I recognized that Western media really misrepresents these, these people. You know, there's a, a kind of a pitiful, kind of a pitiful picture of these women as being pathetic to, you know, uh, downtrodden, um, uneducated. And the truth is, these women are survivors and they're heroes and they are the engine of every community. I've worked in um, a lot of refugee camps. This is, this is one in um, Thailand and it's uh, refugees from Myanmar. And I've worked in super remote parts of the world. To get to this village where they were solving a water problem, I had to um, drive for four hours in a pickup truck after we left the last road to get here. And then these families welcomed me as though I were family. And some of the refugee camps are fantastic, really. Not very many, but some of them are if they give the people control over their lives. And if they don't fence it and you know, just give them some food help or some shelter help. But one day I was in this refugee camp, and it was the worst one I'd ever been to. And I just loved this young Somali woman, and her baby was sick, and her family had been in this refugee camp for 10 years. And I just had this crisis that I think we all have, which is, this is too big, this is, this is too much, what am I doing? I can't make a dent in this. But I took the picture and it was used and two years later I was in a refugee coordinator's office in Richmond, Virginia. And this picture had been torn out of the magazine and, and put on the wall. And I, you know, I, I just went, I was startled and I said, oh my gosh. Uh, and the refugee co coordinator looked at the picture and said, Oh, yeah. Well, she's one of our refugees. Her family, you know, sh her family's fine. She's working at um, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Her husband's working at Walmart. And the baby's fine. And, you know, and I just looked at him and said, you know her? And he said, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought, geez, Annie, you don't get to give up. I mean, I didn't get her out of the refugee camp. This aid organization did. And if I can help those aid organizations continue to, to lift people out of their circumstances, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I called my girlfriends, who are some of the best photographers in the world, and they had all, all experienced the same thing, an understanding that women, these women were fabulous and were misrepresented. And I asked them, okay, we've learned from these girls that it, when they work together, they can get anything done. So how about we work together? And they all said yes, and we started Ripple Effect Images. And what we do is we cover success in programs that help women become empowered. And then we create fundraising materials for them. We make films and we do fantastic pictures so that they have a better way of telling their own story of success. And it's just been the most important thing in my career to do this. And a lot of it is a combination of women and environment, and women and climate change. These are kids seeing water come out of the ground for the very first time. And it works. You know, we've, we've uh, done over 50 films, and we have a photo archive of over 50,000 images, and our photographers <laughs> are the best. You know, Carol Guzzi, I think she's won more Pulitzers than anyone in the history of photography. Amy Vitale, who's doing heavy lifting in Africa to, to promote things. Lynn Johnson. Um, Daniel Berhulik. 
John Stanmeyer. These are such great people, and they are telling these stories in a way that makes a huge difference. So our aid beneficiaries have been able to raise well over $10 million using these assets that we've given to them. And that, what's better than that? You know, you're telling stories, you're, you're telling truths that don't get covered very often, because it's actually easier to tell stories of disaster than of success. And so that's a lot of what gets covered. Education is one of our pillars. I mean, when you educate a girl, she is going to have a different life. And, you know, the good news is, and you never hear it, right now, apart from the pandemic, there's less extreme poverty, there's less disease, there's more kids in school, the world is getting better. But we don't get to hear that. And it's getting better because girls and women are being empowered. And that will affect their entire communities. And even women who've never had the luxury of an education can be taught skills. You know, economic independence is so important. So, you know, like this woman ha went to this place and she built 50 solar lanterns. And when she was, this is her taking her final exam. They give her a broken one and see if she can fix it. And of course she could fix it. So then she gets to take the 50 lanterns back to her home village and just look at her body language when she arrives and gives all her girlfriends who've never had electricity the gift of light, a bottle of light that will help them in so many ways. Just, you know. Thank you. These women are extraordinary. This woman, not a day of education, but she was taught to run a, a, a desalinator, a solar desalinator in one of the driest parts of India. So she's like, more important than the mayor in our village. I went to cover, uh, I went with a health group, because we health is another one of our pillars. And, you know, we were going to visit salt workers. And a lot of it's done by girls and women. It's a tough job, and the salt goes everywhere, you can see. Um, so they were trying to help these women with the health issues. And you can, here's a, a couple of the, of the girls and women working in a salt mine. But at the end of the day, this little girl went over, and she had a solar lantern, which I hadn't seen. So I'm like, oh, cool, what, you know, what, what do you do with your solar lantern? And she told me that because she has to work during the day, the solar lantern lets her go to school at night. And I, I did some research and found out that 70,000 kids in her region were now going to night school because of solar lanterns. That's how they get out of the salt mine. That's how they get out. And I was in Tanzania, and I, I met this group of women, Maasai women. And the Maasai tribes, you know, they're pastoral, so they have cattle and animals, but they live in these little villages, as you can see behind these women, that are called bomas. And at night, they are trapped inside their houses because... They can put the cattle in pens, but the, but the lions and the leopards and all those animals are going to come in. And so this group of women said, well, enough of that. And so the first thing they did is, and I walked with them for about two hours to a stranger's house. And they punched a hole in the roof and they built a chimney to, to ventilate her, her house. Because most people don't realize the number one killer of women and of children under five is indoor pollution from heat and cooking fires. It's number one. We should know that. So anyway, they started venting the homes. And what I loved is, here's this little girl. She's carrying her baby sister. And she is witnessing the women solve the problem in their community. How cool is that? You know, we all want to see success in someone who, who looks like us. And the next day, they came back with a solar panel. I'm not kidding. And these gals sat down and did the entire wiring for the solar panel and put it on top of the house because the, the, you know, the predators will not come in if there's light. They won't come into that village if there's light there. And so this solar panel will protect the entire community, and it's being done by women. 
And this is the woman who, for the first time in her life, could cook without breathing in toxic smoke. What I think we all want in our photographs is intimacy. I think the goal, no matter what kind of photography you love, you want some kind of intimacy in your images. And with intimacy comes empathy and education and learning. So I think as we come to understand light, as we come to understand composition, we then move on to a deeper form of earning moments. And I say earning very sincerely because these kinds of images are, it's not a drive-by shooting. It means you, you sincerely give some of your time and your energy and your compassion to people or to wildlife in a way that is non-threatening. So when I was lucky enough to learn a little bit about wildlife photography, it also informed my ability to work with people. Because you just have to accept you're in their world. You have to abide by their way of doing things. Or they will flee. And if we can just put that in our hearts and put the same kind of time into photographing the human animal, the results are, are moving and, and important. And we can tell a deeper story. And that's what, that's what makes me get up every day. The privilege of telling people's stories so that we all understand a little better. And it doesn't matter where we are. The stories are there. They're, you guys have stories in your backyard, in your community. And, you know, I hope I can encourage you to wake up in the morning and say, I am going to find a story about something I care about. And within that story, I'm going to grow. And because of that story, I might be able to have some impact. I might be able to open people's eyes to something that they just didn't realize. And what's better than that, you know? to wake people up, to bring people together, to take fear out of our lives because we feel compassion and empathy and joy. It's the joy of life. So, you know, I, this is what I've been privileged to learn, starting with National Geographic and then through the wonderful aid organizations I've been lucky enough to work with. Um, I've seen the world, even though I grew up in a family where we never left the state. Um, and I've also worked in every single state in our country, which I never thought would happen. But in all of it, what I want is for my pictures to make a difference, to um, somehow, sometimes raise money, which I love, um, but also to, have people stop and, and pause in their lives and say, oh my gosh, what is that? That's extraordinary. And then they can be led into how they can participate to save this creature or to, to help these women or to um, just send pictures to your kids going, look what happened on my little lake today. The other thing that I really hope you guys will do is have fun. I just, you know, I was so lucky early in my career, but I just wasn't having a whole lot of fun because I was too scared that they'd figure out they hired the wrong person. And <clears throat> so go out there, get in the water, get, lay on your back, you know, go to the market, just be ready for whatever is coming. And you just don't know when it might happen. I was with this woman in Ecuador. All of a sudden, this mime comes out of nowhere, you know. And the baby's like, what you doing? You know? <laughs> Get on the ride. Get in the water. I'm going to finish um, with a, a little 
day in my life that where I learned so much about the basic joy of photography. I was invited out into the middle of nowhere, <laughs> and there was a family that was having a real cattle branding, and I don't know how many of you guys have been lucky enough to attend one, but for the family, it's bigger than Christmas. I mean, everybody shows up. Grandma's making pies, and the guy, you know, everybody's working, everybody's eating, everybody's laughing. So the, it was such a remote ranch that they invited me to stay in the, you know, in their ranch house. So I'm grateful, and the next morning, I wake up because there's this soft light coming through the window, and I look out, and I see this sky, which I call a mackerel sky, and you hardly ever get them. I'm like, oh! And the sun wasn't up yet, but the horses were in the pasture. So I grabbed my camera, and I ran down to the fence. And this horse came right to me. And I'm like, oh, oh, shooting. And, um, and then, you know, it all fell apart. And I remember vividly going, whoa. And I turned around, and that's when I saw like four or five cowboys leaning up against a fence looking at the crazy lady from National Geographic. <laughs> and that's when I realized I was in a t-shirt and underwear because I was so excited about the light and the clouds and the horses and the, you know, that I forgot to put my pants on. And I wish for each and every one of you that you have days like that as photographers where you're just having the, so much fun, you forget to put your pants on. So these are just pictures from the rest of that day. And I try to tell a story every day, but places like this are just, Alive. This was the cook. The uncle got arrested several times that day. And this little guy came to me at the end of the day, and he was seven years old. I remember, and he went, you won't see me wrestle a steer? And I'm like, yes, I do. Okay, let's go. So he goes over to this little calf, and he wrestles and wrestles. Calf did not move an inch. <laughs> it's looking at me like, okay, here we go again. So I said, well, does your little calf have a name? Yup, his name's Michelangelo. I thought, great parenting. Out here in the middle of the United States, he knows who one of the most important artists that ever lived was. And then he said, I got some other ones back at the barn named for the other Ninja Turtles. We are funny, and we are alive, and thank you so much for coming to hear my talk.